I'm at the Bell Tower near Elizabeth Quay in Perth City. These 700 year old bells rang in Trafalgar Square, London. They celebrated the return of Captain James Cook from his rediscovery of Australia. 200 years later, they were donated to Australia for our bicentenary. Today, their song links us with our English heritage. But how can we upgrade them for the 21st century? These bells are massive. When they were first being held at St. Martin's in the Fields, the medieval church almost collapsed under their weight. Why then do bells need to be so big? Here's my own set of bells. The different sounds you're hearing are because of the different amounts of water in each of these glasses. When we have a lot of water, the sound is much lower pitched. This is because the water in the glass makes it harder for it to vibrate. We have a longer wavelength and much lower frequency. On the other hand, the glass without water in it is free to vibrate as it wants, giving us a high frequency and low wavelength. For this same reason, a bigger bell means a lower pitch and a longer wavelength. This is because there is more stuff to vibrate, so the vibrations take longer. Having a range of sizes is important because we can then have a wider range of sounds. But why big ones in particular? Sound is just another type of wave, the same as these water waves to my left. When this type of wave reaches a gap in a barrier, it is able to pass through and spread out behind this gap. This spreading out is called diffraction. This is the reason why all of Elizabeth Key has waves in it, not just the area directly behind the bridge. For a gap of a given size, we have the most diffraction when the wavelength is the largest. The gaps between buildings are just like the gaps between the river and the quay. When we have a small wavelength, not much diffraction can occur, and we get dead zones behind each of the buildings. On the other hand, if we have a much longer wavelength, then a huge amount of diffraction can occur. Step one of upgrading the swan bells is to make them able to be heard in the outer suburbs. To do this, we need to have a huge amount of diffraction, which means a super long wavelength. What we need is a bell 10 meters in diameter and 1,000 tons in mass. This would be on the limit of human hearing, with frequencies almost too low for our ears to detect. Welcome to St. George's Cathedral and one of the largest musical instruments in Western Australia. The West Organ features in many of the concerts held at this cathedral every year. I've always wondered, why are bells bell-shaped? Wouldn't it be much easier to make a sphere, or even a cylinder like this organ? Come to it, could we make it flat, like a glockenspiel? Sound is the transfer of energy through the air by using waves. To get this energy there, you need to make an object vibrate. And these vibrations will then transfer to the surrounding air. Our brains then interpret these as sound. When we have a flat sheet of metal, then any vibration is possible, which means that when we hit it, they all happen at once and it sounds terrible. Bending it into a cylinder, however, just like the organ pipes, then we restrict the number of vibrations which can occur and trap these ones going around in a circle. This means that when we hit it, it sounds a lot nicer. Just like an organ pipe, a cylindrical bell can only produce a single frequency. So if we want to make this tone more interesting, we're going to have to use wave interference. I've made this model to help illustrate what happens when two waves interact with each other. A wave is just energy telling matter what to do. Here the energy is saying go up, and here it's go down. The same is true for this other wave. Here we have the two waves coinciding with each other. Both of the go up instructions are together, so the matter goes up a lot. On the other hand, we have two go down instructions together, which means that it also goes down a ridiculous amount. This is why it's so steep on the rises and the falls. Destructive interference occurs when we have a peak meet a trough, or a trough meet a peak. You can see them cancelling each other out, which means that matter is pretty much doing nothing. This is a note from the cathedral organ. And here's another. If we play them together, it sounds like this. 
That wah 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 sound here isn't because I'm pressing the notes any differently. It's because the different sounds are interfering with each other. This is what is known as beat frequency, and it's fundamental to how music works. As you can see, the greater the difference between the two frequencies, the more beats are being produced. Both spherical bells and the ones with this varying shape can produce multiple frequencies. This is because changing diameter has the same effect on sound as different levels of water in our cups from earlier. Of the two, the more compact shape gives us a much better sound. Expert bell makers will add or remove metal from their bells to produce just the right frequencies to interfere in just the right way. If you were to give such an expert bell maker one of these spherical bells, you'd probably end up with one looking more like this. We need to find another way to improve our bells for the 21st century. At the moment, we have something which looks a lot like a bell, just quite a bit bigger. As we all know, the whole point of a bell is to vibrate and pass these vibrations onto the air. I've come to the Perth Mint to help discover which material best fulfills these requirements. We already know that we can make bells out of metal, but what about plastic and wood? A simple test tells us which one sounds the best. As expected, the metal gives the most sonorous ring. If we look at the internal structure of each of the materials in turn, you can see why. Metal atoms are closely bonded and surrounded by highly delocalized electrons, which are free to move. This means that any vibrations are quickly transferred throughout the lattice. On the other hand, plastic and wood are constructed with loosely held molecules without any of these free electrons. This makes vibrations significantly harder to pass on, which is why the vibrations are slower and die out quickly. I think our choice is clear. We need to find the metal with the most free electrons and the tightest bonding. Turns out that the perfect combination of those two things is silver. The Perth Mint have been amazing and they're going to let me tap this one kilogram block of silver with a spoon. When I do, it sounds like this. Our choice is clear. The perfect bell is made of silver. At today's prices, our 1,000 ton solid silver bell comes in at a cool $640 million. But I think the investment is well worth it. The song of the Perth Bell Tower links us with our English heritage. But perhaps one day, this will be sung in a different tune. Massive thank you to the people of the Perth Bell Tower, Isle of Voyage Restaurant, Perth Mint and St George Cathedral for letting me come and film. These are some really awesome places and I would definitely recommend checking them out. New episodes of Perth Science are landing every month with some cool episodes in space in the near future. Make sure to subscribe so as not to miss any of our videos. In the meantime, this has been James Singley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.